Yeah, yeah. Oh, good. I'm glad that worked out. <laughs> yeah, okay. <laughs> uh, welcome, everyone. Good evening. I'm sorry to interrupt your conversations, but it's great to have a full room tonight. I'm Sarah Gardner, and this talk is sponsored by the Center for Environmental Studies and the Class of 1960s Scholars Program in Environmental Studies. Um, and we're so pleased tonight to have John Cavanaugh and Robin Broad, Class of 76. Um, many of her old professor, or sorry, former professors, <laughs> um, to cheer her on, and we really welcome you. It's great to have you all here tonight. Um, earlier, they led a seminar discussion with several um, scholars in the Environmental Center, which went wonderfully. Um, and then we had dinner, and the room probably smells like pizza. Sorry about that. Um, the garlic knots. Yeah, we had a lot of garlic knots. Um, so anyway, um, our wonderful um, Roger Bolt is going to do the introductions, but first I'll just start with the land acknowledgement. Um, we respectfully acknowledge that Williams College stands on the ancestral homelands of the Stockbridge Munsee Mohegans for the indigenous peoples of the region now called Williamstown. Following tremendous hardship after being forced from their homelands, they continue as a sovereign tribal nation in Wisconsin, which is where they reside today. We pay honor and respect to their ancestors past and present as we commit to building a more inclusive and equitable space for all. Please welcome Professor Bolton. Careful of the cord. Well, thank you very much. I am really honored to introduce Robin Broad and John Cavana. I'm one of at least uh, six former faculty members here. <laughs> Uh, five of us taught Robin and learned from her, and one of us was a dean who I'm sure learned something from Robin as well. Uh, this is kind of a homecoming for Robin, so I hope John will forgive me for uh, spending a bit more time on her. He's used to it. <laughs> After graduation, she spent a year teaching economics at Xavier University in Mindanao, Philippines then got a PhD from Princeton's Woodrow Wilson School of Public Affairs, where she studied development economics with W. Arthur Lewis, a very famous Nobel Prize economist. As students may be interest, interested to know, she did not go on directly to academia. She worked as an international economist in the US Treasury Department. Then she was senior staff economist for a Democratic congressman who was not yet the household name he later became one Chuck Schumer. <laughs> Robin joined the faculty of American University in 1990, and she's now professor of international service there. She's won many awards, including a Guggenheim Fellowship and the International Student Studies Association's Tickner Award for, quote, high quality pioneering scholarship and teaching and mentoring. She's written five books, three with John. Now John is a Dartmouth graduate. He met Robin. Forgive him. <laughs> <laughs> he, he and Robin met when they both were graduate students at Princeton. And he has been with the Institute for Policy Studies for nearly 40 years and served as its director for over 20 years. Uh, the IPS is a scholarly think tank in Washington, DC and has been a major force in liberal scholarship and activism since the 1960s. I think the first big issue there for it was, the, was opposing the Vietnam War. John is also a prolific author and his book with Richard Barnett, Global Dreams, Imperial Corporations and the New World Order sold over 60,000 copies, which I think is quite an accomplishment for an academic book on, on a subject like that. Now their latest book, The Water Defenders, tells how people in El Salvador battled to prevent an international gold mining company from poisoning their water. Robin and John played a significant role in that battle as inside outsiders, as they put it. But they make it clear the real heroes are people named Marcelo, Miguel, Vidalina, Dora, 
Antonia, Manuel, and other ordinary people, as the subtitle puts it. The core of the resistance was rooted in poorer communities. But part of the story is how poor people convinced many not so ordinary Salvadorans from joining them, like a cabinet minister, a wealthy businessman, and the Catholic Archbishop. And the book is a marvelous account of social interaction, the coalitions that these many different people, starting with a core of very poor people, but expanding to include many Americans and even people from the Philippines and other places. And social interaction, I happen to know, is something that Robin has thought about deeply ever since she was at Williams. So I will let them proceed. So thank you. Um, and thank you for that. I, I'm teaching a class right now in Washington, <laughs> D.C. <laughs> it's just kind of going on by its own as itself. <laughs> um, but So that is a humbling introduction by a man who's clearly done his homework. <laughs> it's also a, a, a little strange to be up here with my, okay, they're supposed to be former professors, but this feels a little like an oral exam. <laughs> so we'll, we'll see, but um, it's really wonderful to be back in Williamstown after, I haven't been here for 45 years. Um, which is far too many decades. And to be here at this historical moment with global climate talks going on in Egypt, and rumor has it there was some kind of an election <laughs> yesterday that may have an influence with the, on the future of not only our country, but the rest of the world. In any case, um, let me rewind and begin with a thank you to the class of 1960 scholars program. And Sarah, where, where are you? To the Center for Environmental Studies, a special shout out to Sarah Gardner um, for dealing with all the many emails back and forth. And also to Dee Dee Lewis, who, who put this event together. Um, and also to my professors, it's hard to call them by their first names, <laughs> by their Professor Bill Mumar, Roger Bolton, Tom Jorling, Ralph, Ralph, um, Bradburn, who's hiding over there, um, my cousin Alan Bashakin, <laughs> who's in the back row. Um, I don't know, I, um, but, um, oh, and also to Robert Gaudino, who some of you knew, some of you didn't know, but um, a, with memories of him, his spirit always lives within me. Um, and it's lived within me on my travels. And um, so to great appreciation to not only those people, but to all of you. And we're honored, we, I am honored by the presence of all of you in this room tonight. Um, we were told that the Bolton rule was that if we got 10 people, we were doing well. So <laughs> this is pretty, this is pretty nice. So I graduated in, 1977, before some of you were born, I was supposed to graduate in 1976. And since then, I've been on numerous, for want of a better word, let me call them journeys. Oh, Chief, I forgot you, Chief. <laughs> How can one forget Chief? Chief Satterthwaite, um, who changed the way I see everything in the world, for good and bad ways. <laughs> I'm definitely haunted by you. Um, <laughs> I have been uh, in a good way. <laughs> But, you know, you see a really ugly building and you say, Sheaf would say, I have to find the beauty in it. <laughs> um, but so I've been on numerous journeys, many of them with my husband, co-research, co-author here with me tonight, John Cavana, last name rhymes with banana for some reason that he'll have to explain. Um, but I, I truly do not think those journeys and the way they unfolded would have been possible without the incredible foundation I got here 
at Williams. Um, indeed, my journey began here in Williamstown, um, in part from the both wonderful and bizarre classes that were taught by three of these professors at one time. <laughs> um, um, John's began separately um, in, in especially in the UN in Geneva, where he worked be where he worked studying corporations and corporate power before we met in 1978. Um, and then yeah, we're going to get up to more current decades <laughs> fairly quickly. Um, and then building on those separate foundations, our journeys really took off after we met, when we first met, went to the rural Philippines, the Southern Philippines, where I had had the fortune of living as a Henry Luce fellow after, my, after I graduated Williams. So thank you to Williams for that. Um, so tonight we're gonna to take you on a different journey. We're going to take you on our decade of journeys to another country, El Salvador. It is a, some of you know El Salvador from reading it in the news. Um, it is a surprisingly hopeful story and not one just about El Salvador. And of course, I have to say that to understand everything, you can't just listen to us tonight. You have to go buy our book, <laughs> read our book, listen to our book. Wait, I want to show you. It's in Spanish. <laughs> Don't tell Beacon, our English language publisher, but that. The cover by the Mexican artist is really pretty incredible. Um, so I'm plugging our book. Our publisher and our agent would want us to plug the book. It's signed copies are available at the Williams Bookstore. And there I've done it. The plug is done for the night. Um, so I am a professor and a journeyer, a traveler who feels most at home with grassroots communities in remote parts of the world. I am also a writer and a word crafter. I agonize over every word. That's probably the fault of these people here. <laughs> I agonize over every word in retelling the stories of the ordinary people in those communities who do extraordinary things. Um, and John has no, has for the last, 40 something years had no choice but to agonize with me over every word. So given that we wanted to start by sharing some of those agonized over words. So I'm going to read for about 10 minutes or so. Um, and then we're going to get into two other things related to this. Oh, I'm not gonna read you in Spanish. <laughs> For nearly two weeks, Marcelo Rivera's family could not find him. Then, on June 29, 2009, they received the brief phone call they had been dreading. The anonymous caller was brief. There was a body in an old abandoned well just west of the, San, of the Rivera hometown of San Isidro Cabanas. The well was near the spot where Marcelo had been last seen 12 days earlier getting off the bus at a turnoff to the capital city. During those 12 days, Marcelo's family and friends had been at wit's end, searching frantically, desperately for him. They had spread news of his disappearance to all the barrios in San Isidro and nearby towns. They had even called the police for over a week to no avail. The Rivero family filed a formal complaint with the country's attorney general pleading with him to conduct a search and an investigation into Marcelo's disappearance. But another poor person gone missing up in the rural north meant little to the authorities. After the anonymous tip to Marcelo's family, the police finally acted. They pulled the remains of a body out of the dry 30 meter deep well. So extensive was the torture that the body was unrecognizable. The face was grotesquely disfigured no jaw, no lips, no nose. The fingernails had been ripped off, the testicles bound, the trachea had been broken with a nylon cord. In the assessment of the coroner, the death had been caused by asphyxiation. 
the public prosecutor disagreed, concluding that the death had come from blows to the head of the hammer. Whatever the cause of death, Marcelo Rivera became the first of several water defenders to be assassinated in the 21st century fight over mining in El Salvador. Although we never met Marcelo, we have been haunted by him and the circumstances of his death ever since. Who killed Marcelo and why? Perhaps you know the difference between a tortilla and a pupusa, or perhaps, like us, you are entering this story without a clue. Perhaps El Salvador is not even on your radar screen, or perhaps El Salvador is on your radar screen, but only because of gangs or immigrants who track north. But really, that does not matter. Certainly on one level, this is a story about El Salvador. At the same time, it is not just about El Salvador. This is a David versus Goliath story about a battle between a country and a firing mining company. But it is also a story about how global corporations, be they big gold or big pharma or big oil or big tobacco or big banks, move into poorer communities in countries all over the world. Marcelo's story, before and after his murder, is about the struggle for clean and affordable water everywhere. It is also a story about how workers and communities defending their ear and land, their health and climate, and their rights to defend themselves against corporate incursion. About how to prioritize those rights and the common good versus the usual prioritization of the profits of big corporations and their owners. It is certainly a story about gold and when and why we should leave it in the ground, but it could also be about coal or natural gas or other fossil fuels. And about whether we measure progress in aggregate financial terms or through the well being of people and the planet. And about who gets to make the decisions that affect our and other people's lives. To say that the story of the water defenders versus big gold holds keys to reversing the outside power over outsized power of global corporations today is not an exaggeration. You may find yourself surprised by the relevance of the strategies of the water defenders in El Salvador, whether your focus is on a Walmart in Washington, D.C. or North Adams, a fracking company trying to expand in Texas or Pennsylvania, a petro or petrochemical companies outside New Orleans. Along the way, however cliched the quote attributed to Margaret Mead may have become, you may also find yourself inspired by a small group of thoughtful, committed citizens who stand up to corporate power. We first heard of Marcelo Rivera in May 2009, <clears throat> just a month before his murder. He was a 37-year-old teacher who directed his hometown's cultural center, an avid reader, a person who loved <laughs> theater and the arts, and a good practical joke. We heard his name because he was the leader of the main coalition of Salvadoran groups opposed to mining, the National Roundtable on Mining in El Salvador, or La Mesa. The roundtable was hardly known outside of El Salvador, but we learned of it because the group had been chosen to receive a prestigious human rights award from the Institute for Policy Studies, where John works in Washington, DC. In 2009, the Institute selected the round table to honor <laughs> its opposition to mining companies eager to exploit the gold deposits near El Salvador's major river. On a misty night in October, 2009, just months after Marcelo's body was pulled from that well, hundreds gathered at the National Press Club in downtown DC to meet and applaud the Salvadoran water defenders. Among them was Marcelo's youngest brother and best friend, Miguel. Miguel had come in his brother's place. Grief marked his face. Accepting the award on behalf of Miguel and three other La Mesa leaders was a peasant and a community leader from the heart of gold country, Vidalina Morales. Vidalina looked small behind the podium. She at first appeared hesitant, nervous perhaps before the large audience, fragile even. Then she began to speak, 
Her words filled the auditorium almost as though she did not need the microphone. For nearly 20 minutes, Vidalina held the crowd spellbound as she relayed the saga of El Salvador's water defenders standing up to big gold. The Lempa River, she explained, winds through El Salvador like a snake, providing water for over half the population. Water for drinking, for farming, for fishing. Water for cities, as well as the rural population. But the project of the Canadian headquartered Pacific Rim Mining Corporation at its proposed El Dorado site in Miguel and Marcelo's hometown posed serious threats to the Lempa River. Key among the dangers was the toxic cyanide that Pac Rim would use to separate the gold from the rock. Vitalina ended her acceptance speech with a seemingly audacious demand that the government of El Salvador stand up to giant mining firms and choose water over gold by banning the mining of all metal, all metals. Before this, Vitalina had urged the audience to follow a related legal thriller unfolding four blocks to the west where we sat, just past the White House, to the site of a little, tri a little known tribunal in Washington, DC at the World Bank. There, as Vidalina explained, Pac Rim had filed a lawsuit against the government of El Salvador right before Marcelo's death. Pac Rim claimed that El Salvador had to either allow it to mine or to pay the company 300, over $300 million in costs and foregone profits from future mining. Vitalina invoked the upside down world summoned by Uruguayan writer Eduardo Galeano in asking why it was not El Salvador suing Pac Rim since the mining company threatened the water and well being of the country. But that upside down world is the reality of global corporate power and economic rules that affect people around the globe. And as we too think back to that evening, we must admit that we each separately and silently found it just as far-fetched to imagine a national legislature passing a law banning mining as it was to conceive of this tribunal siding with Bidalina and the rest of the water defenders. At the reception following the award ceremony, we huddled with Marcelo's brother, Miguel. Miguel was soft-spoken and gentle in his manner, understandably a bit shy as he asked for help. After all, we had just met. He seemed both incredibly detailed on the details of what to do no next and shell-shocked by the chain of events, by his brother's murder and by the lawsuit. But his appeal was urgent, direct, and heartfelt. We don't know this tribunal or how it works. We don't know what to expect. Can you help us find out about this lawsuit? On that misty evening in October 2009, who could have guessed that Miguel's question and Vidalina's call to action would pull us to and thousands of others around the globe into the vortex of three interrelated unknowns for nearly a decade to come? First, there was the on the ground mystery. Who killed Marcelo Rivera and why? Not just who carried out the brutal murder, but who was the mastermind? Second was the mystery at the national level. Could El Salvador possibly become the first nation on earth to ban mining, or at least move closer to that goal? Or did all this hoopla about stopping mining simply mean, as most assumed in 2009, that PACRIM had not paid a high enough bribe to top officials in the Salvadoran national government? And finally, finally, the global thriller, legal thriller. Could little El Salvador possibly prevail against the global mining industry in that court in Washington, DC? Would El Salvador, an economically poorer country, even have enough money to pay for its legal and related costs, enough money to hire a lawyer savvy enough to take on what would undoubtedly be a top corporate law team hired by Pac Rim? We had no idea how these mysteries would play out. But as we joined the hundreds of people who streamed out of the National Press Club 
after the award ceremony that night, we knew that we were hooked. So now let me turn to John. Um, and John, can you, John's gonna pick up from there and start to share some of the key questions and lessons that this book and this experience, this experience raised for us. And then we'll go back and forth for a little bit. And with you all. Great, thanks. It's lovely to be here. I bet about half of you over the last six hours. And what strikes me is you've got some of the best and brightest of the next generation in this beautiful Center for Environmental Studies up here. And you've got some of the, the giants um, who helped create the Clean Water Act and the Clean Air Act and so on here. And if you put this intergenerational set of smarts together, you could probably solve a lot of problems. So it's, it's, we're really looking forward to the conversation. Just a word on where I come from, um, not Williams, but um, so the Institute I work at, the Institute for Policy Studies links, does research and writing, but linked to social change. We work with groups like the Poor People's Campaign, with them actually pushing to get the federal government to invest massively in water infrastructure. Uh, they pointed out, they interviewed poor people all over the country and said, what's the number one environmental issue? And it was interesting. This was about five years ago. It wasn't climate. Um, climate was number two. It was water. And uh, beautifully, about a year ago, $55 billion was put into water infrastructure, getting rid of all the lead pipes left in this country and, and doing other things. So just our notion is with social movements, you can take on the entrenched power of big corporations and win. Now, quickly to pick up where Robin left off, the, the spoiler alert here is some of you know this, but yes, in 2017, the legislature of El Salvador made that country the first in the world to ban all mining to save its rivers. And six months earlier, in a unanimous decision, actually that in, in the Salvadoran Congress, the divided Salvadoran Congress, even more divided than our US Congress, it was a unanimous vote to ban all mining to save their rivers. And six months earlier in a unanimous decision in this tribunal that is rigged towards corporations, the three tribunalists ruled against the mining company uh, and in favor of El Salvador. So you're wondering how did these amazing victories happen? And I'll just say a few words on this. Um, first, I know some of you are scientists. So just a word on the relationship between gold mining and water. It's a very bad <laughs> relationship um, for three reasons. One, gold mining uses a ton of water. And a lot of countries like El Salvador have very little. Uh, two, industrial gold mining uses cyanide to separate the gold from the rock. Um, and again, if that leaks into the land and into the surrounding rivers, that's deadly. And third, this was something for us to, I mean, Robin got some scientific training at, at Williams. I got none uh, at Dartmouth. This was a shocker that about half of the gold mines in the world, when you smash open the rock to get the gold, um, there's sulfides in the rock. And when those sulfides are then exposed to air and water, it turns into sulfuric acid. And it then leaches whatever else is in there. Often there's arsenic, there's often iron into the surrounding ground, which then makes it into the streams. And in one mine, we spent a lot of time and it's the place that gives us nightmares in El Salvador, decades after the mining stopped, the streams are still uh, orange, yellow, cranberry red from the residues. There are Roman mines in, Spa, in Spain that are 2,000 years old that are still suffering from what is called acid rock uh, drainage. So mining is very hard to do in a safe way. It's, people are working on safer ways, but this is one of the giant challenges we all face as we shift from fossil fuels to so-called clean energy, which is heavily dependent on the mining of lithium manganese, cobalt, and other things. Um, so just keep that in the back of your mind. It's one of the great challenges for moving forward. Um, in short, what we found, the lessons, we kind of distilled them down to three. So I'll share them with you because I think they're true for most of the battles that we're fighting today in this country, including the giant battle that we're all fighting uh, for our climate. 
One is that bottom-up power from communities is vital. Um, and it can't just be brute sort of force of people. It's got to be incredibly well-educated. Part of what blew us away was how folks, um, most of whom did not have college educations, educated themselves about mining uh, in these communities in the North and then spread that education. A lot of it through amazing cultural workers uh, like Marcelo. They also had a community radio station but they learned all about the impact of mining on water uh, and spread that beautifully, first locally, then nationally. And then uh, when they came to us and asked for help to a whole wonderful set of global allies. So that's one. Two, um, this maybe sounds obvious, but framing the fight in a positive way. So they never emphasized that they were, quote, anti-mining. Their whole approach was around water. They were water defenders. Water is life. We can live without gold, but we can't live without water. And that proved to be an incredibly powerful, unifying message, which brings to the third and final point here in terms of uh, how you do this work, which is, well, particularly, so this is true in the United States. If you're sitting there in El Salvador at this time, you had three major parties, uh, one of the more progressive, two more conservative. The progressive party had at best a third of the legislature. So you weren't gonna win with just that. And even that party was being wooed by left parties around Latin America that said mine uh, and use the proceeds to address poverty. That was the approach at that time in Venezuela under Hugo Chavez and Bolivia under Evo Morales. So. Even the progressive party wasn't there with you. So how do you win? And it was wonderful to sit with these folks because they, they said, okay, we've got to build as many allies as we can, both likely allies and unlikely allies. And the likely allies were uh, the uh, environmental groups, women's groups, um, youth groups, and their international components. So, so to us, they said, can you get us, you know, we got them Friends of the Earth and Greenpeace and so on. And the, we got progressive faith groups and so on, also globally, uh, to put pressure on the company. So get the likely allies, but then go after the unlikely ones. And it's interesting, in El Salvador at this time, many of you remember, I mean, if you ask most Americans, one Salvadoran, they remember uh, Archbishop Oscar Romero, who, then, who became recently a saint uh, in the Catholic Church. Um, one would have expected the Catholic Church to be allies, but after he was assassinated um, in the Civil War in El Salvador, the Vatican got smart and started appointing a series of very conservative archbishops. So the archbishop at this moment was an Opus Dei guy. Um, so most of the people, and this, I've been in these battles in U.S. groups, most of the people in the coalition said, forget that guy, Opus Dei, don't, don't even go to him. And some of the more creative ones pointed out the obvious, if we don't, if we get him, we've got the Catholic Church, we've got priests all over the country giving homilies. So they, they worked on this guy, they tried to get a meeting, they were sort of blown off for a long time. Finally, they got a meeting. And it was so interesting to hear about this. They get into the archbishop's uh, little office, which we've been in, and they start talking to him. And I don't know if you've ever been in a meeting where you're getting nowhere. I mean, you usually can feel it when you're getting nowhere. <laughs> they were getting nowhere. And finally, one of them mentioned cyanide, that you use cyanide to separate the gold from the rock. And all of a sudden, the archbishop wake, wakes up and looks at them and said, why didn't you mention that before? I'm, I'm a, have a degree in chemistry. I know that cyanide is toxic. We can't have that here. And he shifted the Catholic Church onto the side of the water defenders. Uh, and, and they got the second one, too, by, in a sense, sort of buttering them up in a nice way. They put them at the front of a march. I mean, very clever things. They, they knew they had to win somebody over in the right-wing party. So this right-wing party would be more divisive than Democrats and Republicans. The right-wing party had been the party of death squads during the Civil War. So again, you're saying to people, reach out to this guy. And it turns out that the leader of the Environment Commission from the right-wing party was a young guy who'd gone to Georgetown, um, learned in the US about this big mining spill that some of you will remember in Colorado when the EPA was poking around in Colorado in a mine, an old mine, 100 years old in this bright yellow 
liquid came flying out of this mine into the river that went into the next river that went through Southern Colorado, through New Mexico, shooting up to Utah, contaminating the land for, this was a big story in maybe 2014, 15. He'd seen that, he found out one of his ancestors was an environmentalist. He went to a forum of the water defenders. He learned about mining and he said, we can't have this. Water is life. Really interesting guy named Johnny Wright Saul. So they reached out to Johnny Wright Saul, whose father is the biggest sugarcane guy in El Salvador, <laughs> using more water than anybody else. But <laughs> leave, so you leave aside the fight over sugarcane. You focus on gold mining. You've now got Johnny Wright Saul. We were working on, I mean, they got a wonderful lawyer then to fight on the legal case who has become a close friend of ours. He went to West Point, was on the wrong side of the Civil War, but then saw things happen in the war that woke him up, Luis Parada. So the key is you gotta be, you gotta be brave and you gotta, you've gotta think outside the box. You've gotta find allies who normally wouldn't be with you. And with that, oh, and then finally, and this was, Robin was sort of modest about this, this Philippine governor, oh my God, <laughs> wonderful guy. You know, here's the mining company saying, you should just see our mine in the Philippines, it's so sustainable. So we fly him halfway around the world and he testifies, he's got these beautiful before and after photos of this mountain that's then turned into sort of a hell hole. And um, that helped turn a bunch of people around. So, um, those are good lessons, I think, for all of us. Um, so back to you, here. Okay, so when we put this together, there's a subtitle. Sarah, the subtitle is something about, what's the subtitle here? Um, it's something about the green tide in the rest of Latin America. The rising right. green tide. The rising green tide. So do you want to start with that? Yeah, so just a few words about this, because we've fact, been... We've been very focused, yeah, then I'll go back to Robin for a final word before we open it up. Um, we've been very focused on the US election for obvious reasons here. And it actually turned out much better than most of us feared, and, but we've still got a lot more to, to learn, a lot more counting to do. But we just wanted to just for a second, shift your gaze to the rest of Latin America, the rest of the Americans, uh, Americas. And because um, I'm sure a lot of you are thinking, is this just a, a you know, is El Salvador an outlier or is it part of something bigger? Uh, and where can we turn from for, for, for hope? Uh, so here, I'm just going to do a quick quiz here. Imagine a president uh, recently, <laughs> you don't want a quiz. A <laughs> sure you do. Imagine a president who promises to turn his country into a global powerhouse of life. Okay, there's a new president in Latin America. Who would that be? Any guesses? Brazil. Brazil's close, but it's not not uh, not Uruguay, not Chile. Uh, you're, 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 these are all good answers. These are these are all. Uh, it's a guy elected in in June of this year, first progressive president in this nation's history, Colombia. Colombia. Yeah. Gustavo Petro, whose vice president is a former domestic worker who fought against illegal gold mining, the first Afro-Colombian elected vice president or president in any in Colombia's history. Gustavo Petro, amazing human rights leader. He gave the most lyrical, it's, it's like it was written by a poet speech at the UN General Assembly in September. But he has pledged he's going to end fracking. He's, he's respecting a ban that the Supreme Court set in place of mining in the uplands where the watersheds begin. And he's going to stop all new fossil fuel uh, production in that country. That's Colombia. Imagine a president who pledges to fight for zero deforestation. So who would that be? That's Lula in Brazil. And that's the right country to do that because that's the lungs of the world. That's He's got most of the Amazon is in Brazil. It's also Colombia, Peru, and Ecuador, and so on. So that's number two. He was elected um, nine days ago as the president of Brazil. Imagine a president who ran into turning his country into, quote, a graveyard of neoliberalism. <laughs> neoliberalism is sort of free market economics that's very pro corp Who would have said that? Chile, yeah. Uh, that. <laughs> <laughs> Gabriel Boric, <laughs> student leader. I will say as an aside that my institute gave not only a human rights award to the water defenders, but to each of those three people a long time ago. 
So we pick uh, presidents, <laughs> uh, hopeful presidents of the future. So that's, that's Chile. Um, in Honduras, which a year ago you would have said was a narco sort of mafia state, in Honduras, these are all, those three were elected in the last year. Honduras, also in the last year. Um, a woman, Xiomara Castro, won in a landslide by linking up with the number three candidate, who was kind of a jerk. So they were going against the narco-fascist, and the, the, the number two and number three parties come together, form an alliance. I mean, unfortunately, he's her vice president. This, you know, he's, but he wasn't, you know, he's an okay guy. He's just conservative. Anyway, she wins and immediately announces a ban on all new open pit mining in Honduras. So, and part of what is so stunning about this is that 20 years ago, there was a big debate in Latin America over the future, but the debate was between free market people who wanted to mine and pull all the oil and gas out of the ground and use it to enrich themselves versus a set of socialist governments who wanted to mine the land to death, but to use it for you know, some of the proceeds for social programs. That was the debate. So there is now a new wave that is rooted around environment, around indigenous people, around women's rights that has emerged. And not just, I mean, I mentioned the countries that those four countries now have presidents with that kind of platform. And many others, what we're, we're going tomorrow to Amherst where one of Robin's friends, Manuela Peak, um, is the partner of a indigenous leader in Ecuador who ran for president last year and got 20% of the vote in the first round. Um, and with sort of the second, Latin America is cool in this respect. We should learn from this. Their elections are two rounds. So everybody runs, 16 candidates in Peru in the first round, then the top two go to a second round. And that's, it's, it, that's what has given you the possibility of people with great vision to emerge in that first round. Then they have to build a coalition to win the second round. So that is one thing, this is a great tension in our country and in those countries, then when you got elected, or Lula, you know, you have four weeks to make a coalition, sort of a grand coalition with centrist parties to win. And that does limit some of what you can do as you govern. So just to put a little bit of a reality check on it, and social movements always get ticked off about that, uh, just as of course they do here. But here actually Joe Biden had to listen to social movements to win over Bernie and Warren voters to get elected. And he actually ran on a pretty progressive platform in the end, and he governed on it for his first year, at least year and a half. So um, there are social movements in the book. We talk about social movements. Some of you, I know some of the students have been to Costa Rica. Costa Rica has banned almost all mining in that country because it's built a development model around a quarter of its country being protected areas and around ecotourism. Uh, there, uh, Robin did this uh, work. There are seven provinces of the 21 in Argentina that have banned mining, mainly around glacial areas. Shouldn't mine around glaciers for somewhat obvious reasons, but some other provinces as well. Also very strong movements in Panama uh, and in other countries, obviously in Ecuador, which is actually in the province of this leader, Yacu Perez has banned mining and around uh, the big city in his province. So I don't wanna, I just wanna say, wow. <laughs> so think about that for a moment in a world where the media tends to focus on the authoritarian leaders. There's now one in El Salvador, unfortunately, Bukele, but the Philippines, let's not talk about that, you know, uh, Poland and so on. We, we focus on the authoritarian dictators. We don't focus on the fact that um, just below us, there's a whole, hemisphere that's rising up with a different vision of what the future could be. So back to you, Robin, and then we can open it up. Okay, so I would, as you can, we can go back and forth for, you know, <laughs> six hours, eight hours, what, whatever you're willing to do. But, but I'm, so I was going to talk some more, but I'm watching the time and I think this might be a very good time for us to stop talking and for us to open it up and let, I don't know, Roger, Sarah, Chief, <laughs> the rest of you, anyone else who wants to talk, 
um, make comments or questions as you wish. And if no one wants to talk, we'll just go <laughs> back and forth to dominating the, the conversation. But I actually have no idea what time this ends. Um, you, neither do you, but when it, <laughs> Um, it's somewhat up to you, but we can definitely have 15 minutes of questions and then. Well, then this is definitely a time for us to stop <laughs> talking. Okay. So I don't know who's running this. Do you we'll want to just open up? John, can you move sure, this down there? Sure. Who has a thought here? Wait, you can. Thought. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. I remember that the Archbishop was actually quite inspired by Pope Francis. Right. Of course, Pope Francis is from Latin America and certainly has a certain very definite image. And I don't know about the power, but I was wondering how is Pope Francis connected to and partly responsible for this rise of green sure. feeling that you're talking about? Yeah, before I, we say much, are any uh, Catholic pro, Pope Francis experts in the audience here? Um, <laughs> You'll, you'll recall when he first became Pope, he came in and he actually turned to some of our friends in the Philippines who'd done an encyclical letter on the environment many, many years ago, brought one of them in um, and wrote this big, beautiful uh, encyclical on our home uh, that not only lays out a beautiful vision of, of the importance of taking care of nature and taking care of climate, but also in this, the second archbishop, who had not been an activist at all, talked to us about this. He invoked uh, priests to go out in the streets to defend the environment. So, so, so for this book, so first we worked with communities in El Salvador on the real work. And then after the victories in 2016 and 2017, when we started talking to other people about people outside of, who, of of those working on this. When we started talking to them about what had happened in El Salvador and about the victories, at a certain point, it became clear to us and more importantly to the people on the ground in El Salvador that someone needed to write this up. That it, it was something that had to go down in history because so few people actually knew about it. And, and in fact, um, at the time when El Salvador banned mining, the New York Times had an editorial about it, both congratulating in El Salvador, but in a very, you know, in one of those twisted ways saying, but don't any other countries get any ideas about banning mining mm -hmm. because it's not something that should be done. But in El Salvador's case, it was okay. Um, in, in any case, um, so then, then I don't know, somehow we decided to write the book, but not as an academic book. Some of you maybe know the writing of Adam Hochschild, the historian Adam Hochschild. So we had studied writing under him. And as we were telling him this, this he said, you know, you're telling it like narrative nonfiction. You're telling it like a story. Don't you dare do go write it. No offense to academic writing, but don't you dare go write it for a group of academics. And so then when John's talking about this meeting with the Archbishop, then we went back to El Salvador in 2018 and 2019. Fortunately, COVID gave us enough time to finish the research. We went back and it was sort of amazing because those grassroots water defenders in Northern El Salvador, they knew what we knew and they knew what we didn't know. And they basically took us around to fill us in on the parts that we didn't know. So one of these was saying to us, you have to go see this archbishop, um, who I'm not sure really wanted to see us, but when we get back to your question, Roger, when we, we saw him, uh, this was not the Sinai Archbishop, this was the better Archbishop, or though not a great Archbishop. He had closed down and gotten rid of all the records of human rights atrocities. Mm -hmm. So he wasn't exactly considered a friend by everyone. And, and as he was talking about it, he, he sort of was trying to figure out why it was he became involved. <laughs> <laughs> 
And among the reasons he came up with, which I'm sure is true, is he said, well, you know, we kept talking about being with the people. And, but then Pope Francis came in and he said, not only should we talk about being with the people on Sundays, but we should actually march with them. And he said, I don't know it ha how it happened. So it was a, before the legislature passed the, the law banning mining, um, there was a series of months where civil society, the social movements were trying to get the legislature to, to do something, to pass this law. And there was hemming and hawing and whatever. And so the, the social movements decided that they needed a march and that they would march from one part of San Salvador to the legislative assembly. But that they, in order to get the parties to meet them at the legislative assembly, they needed to have someone in the head of the march who the legislature, the head of each party couldn't say no to. And that would be the archbishop. When we talked to the archbishop, he said, I don't know how it happened, but I just ended up in the front of the march. <laughs> how it happened was that this was planned. <laughs> so people were pushing him to the front. So, um, so I mean, not in a bad way, but he was, he was also saying they were talking to him about Pope Francis and he was rereading Pope Francis and Pope Francis was telling them to march with the people. So these things, I don't know, I, we call it sometimes fate and sometimes serendipity and sometimes creative audacity <laughs> of people who, who plan things that seem impossible, but by doing the impossible, you make it possible. Excuse me, <laughs> Professor Muma has a question. <laughs> Two things that are <clears throat> hard to imagine in this country where we demonize anyone who does not agree with us uh, and say very nasty things about them and so forth. And so you could say a little bit something about how they managed to overcome that with some energy, you know, from their point of view, despicable people on the other side. And the second thing is that we're seeing in uh, Sharm el Sheikh right now, it's been going on for a long time, developing countries are all saying, well, you got to develop uh, by destroying the earth. Uh, why don't we get a turn? And uh, in order to raise our people out of poverty, I'm sorry, we're gonna have to sacrifice the earth. In fact, uh, uh, yeah, Congo just made that announcement right. about uh, people interfering to protect the last, by the way, it's the only tropical forest that's left yeah. that is not either go on like Southeast Asia or on the brink of becoming a source of carbon dioxide like the Amazon. Yeah. So do you want me to do the first question? Sure. sure. So when we when we were talking about it, we made it sound very easy. You just yeah, yeah. you you approach the allies <laughs> and then you approach the unequal allies, yeah, and then you yeah, all likely. just march down the street together with the archbishop okay. in front. Yeah. Well, first of all, approaching the allies wasn't necessarily that easy either, as John started to talk about. But um when the the front lines communities, the communities from northern El Salvador, which is where the gold is. Um, when they knocked on the doors of the two main environmental groups in San Salvador in 2005, those groups said, we're not working on mining. Why should we be working on mining? Mm -hmm. Now, they eventually became, I have to be, I mean, oh, this is being recorded. <laughs> 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 they eventually became an important part of, of this coalition, but it took more than a year to go more than it, so when the people in northern El Salvador, the people in northern El Salvador realized that they couldn't just win from northern El Salvador, that they had to make coalitions with other provinces, with other states, and that they actually needed a national coalition. But so that's the un, that's the likely allies, but they took more than a year just to agree on what they wanted until finally someone stood up in one of the meetings and said. Can't we just be all against, can't we all be against mining and forget the 27 other pages of preambles or whatever? Um, but then to approach the unlikely allies was really difficult, as John started to say. I mean, imagine, and we actually talked to each other about this, like, what would we have done? 
and we don't know what the answer is. If someone had said, okay, we're going to go approach Hugo Barrera, who was a co-founder of the Arena Death Party, um, the Death Squads. El Salvador is a small country. El Salvador is the size of Massachusetts. Everyone in El Salvador who, everyone who's still in that country yeah, well, knows some... someone who uh, lost someone in the Civil War. So saying, oh, let's go have, let's go meet with Hugo, our friend Hugo. It's, it's a really hard decision. And not everyone was in favor of that. Um, so you, but what I, what I don't know the answer to, and I don't think it's possible to know, is how they, how they reach this understanding that people could go meet with, well, Hugo was never a friend, but how they could go meet with Minister Barrera um, and not splinter. No. And I'll just say one more thing about this. Um, academics tend to write about coalitions and how they fall apart. The incredible thing about coalitions is not that they fall apart. I mean, if we take 10 of us in this room and put us together in a coalition on something, we're going to have disagreements. There's going to be, I don't know what you call it, biochemical reactions where so-and-so doesn't like so-and-so. So it's not surprising that coalitions fall apart. What's incredible is when they stay together. And what we saw in El Salvador in this coalition La Mesa is that behind, in front of the, in front of the what, in front of the screen, in front of the whatever, everyone was really nice to each other when the press was there. And then they go behind it and all these disagreements would come up. Um, and that was actually quite healthy. But they knew that they had to, they knew that bottom line, they were in agreement. And so they respected each other. Now, again, it's much more complicated than that, but that's my long enough on that. That's yeah. a fascinating situation. Yeah, and yeah. If, you know, if only we could do it in this country, that's, right? That's right. Yeah. So yeah. Bill, could you go see Representative <laughs> Green? <laughs> yeah. yeah, no, I, I, just one more word on that. And then the second question, I think what sort of happened, and we don't do this enough in this country, is I think the people, you know, most of them were against these meetings with the unlikely allies. There were two very persistent people who initiated most of those unlikely ally meetings. And I think the rest of them just said, oh, okay, go try, it's not gonna get you anywhere. And so they they did it. I think the same thing would happen if I decided I was gonna go meet with Mitch McConnell. Everybody in my coalitions would say, are you crazy? I don't think anybody would prohibit it. And I would, if I went and tried and actually something came out of it, I think it would, would be okay. Um, we It's gotta be, well, and we did that. I'll just say on one issue, remember Trump tried to kill the post office. We were able to get about 35 Republicans to vote to save the post office. So that, that would be, that's the post office is sort of like water, <laughs> kind of hard to argue against the post office. Um, but on the other thing, how do you, I mean, there's a beautiful thing of emerging in U.S. environmental groups. There's, as you know, there's been a 40-year fight for environmental justice and environmental equity with poor and low income and communities of color in the U.S., there's a growing realization that that equity has to also needs to be both within the U.S. and then global. Um, but not, there still isn't enough of that. And the main, big mainstream environmental groups have very little of it. And part of that would be um, appreciating the call. I mean, some in the global south are saying we need one trillion dollars worth of a transfer from rich countries to poor each year to truly help these countries leapfrog essentially over fossil fuels. Um, well, here's the good news. This week, so Lula is not yet president of Brazil, the largest nation in uh, Latin America, but he's not in Brazil today. He is in Egypt. So he, he just went. Uh, the, the old guy, the Trump guy, Bolsonaro, uh, well, not only blew off climate, he blew off every northern donor that had been giving money to save the Amazon. So Lula has jumped back in. His first he had an amazing woman who was his environmental minister and then left a little bit pissed off at him about seven years into his two, he had two terms before Lula did. She's back and she's back in the coalition and she's likely to be the next environment minister. She knows all of these people. So Lula is meeting with the rich nations of the world right now, 
trying to get massive investments back into the Amazon. And he and the other presidents I mentioned, it's interesting, they have, they, they have a great rap. I mean, listen to Boric in Chile. He says, okay, we've got all the lithium here. You want us to go mine this stuff, which takes a massive amount of water for your electric cars. Okay, let's think about that right there. Uh, let's let's talk about that. So these three, particularly the three, the more recent, but the poor Honduran president is up against just so much stuff from 12 years of, of, of anarcho-fascists that she's got her hands full. But Boric and Petro and Lula, so Chile, Colombia, Brazil, surrounding the Amazon, it's a beautiful set of countries. Um, they are banding together to talk both about how to take on inequality and climate and how to re reset the conversation with the nations of the North. So I think they will play an oversized role in, now they're doing it at the moment when the global economy is in rough shape. So asking people for a trillion dollars, and this is where again, the creativity will come in. Okay, well, I mean, just as you in Massachusetts just passed a tax on multimillionaires to pay for some of the stuff you want, um, there's all sorts of things that you can tax. And that I think across the political spectrum, right-wing people hate billionaires who abuse power. They hate corrupt uh, officials. Taxing billionaires and large corporations is popular. To do that to save the planet should be popular. So it's a time for a little, I love the term Robin used, creative audacity here. Um, but we've now got some allies in the global south. So okay, just to, to add to that, I'm actually, Ralph, you should be talking now because um, there, no, with, you're <laughs> teaching a course on, on the ethics of offsite, of, of, of offsets. offsets or something like that. They're, they're not going to put up with, with, okay, you all with your three cars, you keep your lifestyle and we change ours so you can keep yours. Um, nor should they. Um, so I, you know, it's we, we is not we in this room, we, we, but, but, but the richer countries have to put something on the table besides just money and besides just saying, okay, you do the work and we'll count it against our commitments. That's just not going to work. Um, and these guys, they're not gonna accept it. Um, and it's not surprise do much as we might not like the statements from the Congo, it's not surprising. No, because no. up till now, that's basically yeah. how it's worked. That we've at these these climate change meetings, at these climate global meetings, we've either it's been money that the North has promised and then hasn't given. Oh, and by the way. I'm a professor of development. The history of AIDS since World War II is basically a history of making life worse for the average person in a poorer country. So we also have to be careful about not just saying we're giving more money because that more money can be, tends to go with the people who caused the problem in the first place. Um, but, um, but it's a moment you, you students, I mean, this is a great moment to walk onto the professional scene or the, the whatever scene with your ideas of, how, of environmental justice, which also is social justice and economic justice, because that's what the cries are for. The cries from the South are, and within countries, are, we're not going to do this on our backs anymore. We've done this for generations. And now you listen, you have to listen to us and feel with us and start to make it right. Um, and the reality is they do care about climate change. They, they may talk about it in different ways. They may see it in different ways, but they care. We just have to have a converse, have to, I don't mean to say it easily, but we're not having a conversation with people, we're still dictating. Your hand's been raised for a long time. I, just, I want to thank you for- Can you introduce yourself first? Sure, Mike Miller, I'm class of 1982. Uh-huh, uh, a youngster. <laughs> <laughs> um, 
it, what you're, you're describing, I assume the whole book is about, you said it's a story. It's a great case study in the real world practice of a multi-stakeholder coalition. And it's also what you said, I think with a great, I wrote it down, a great reframing of the messaging, not anti-mining, pro-water. Yeah. Um, but also in my experience, it, it seems like when you mentioned academia, what was going on here was the exact opposite of academia, where there's the old expression, the politics are so intense because the stakes are so low. <laughs> 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 in this case, the stakes were so high, people were able to put aside some of their politics and fight behind the screen and not in front of it. I've been involved in those kind of coalitions as well yeah. um, to focus on making it happen and strategically understanding the landscape both of the issues and the personalities that were in play. Um, I gave a talk to some students about real world examples of, you know, how do you apply a liberal arts education to real world problems? And that's what that is. Yeah. How do you do the analysis? How do you do the messaging? Yeah. And to create something uh, that may seem impossible, but if you don't try, you, you don't know. And it's so, not always easy. Yep, very so, well said. <laughs> well, thank you. But very well said. And I'm going to have to keep playing that over in my mind when I go back to my teaching job <laughs> about the stakes are so small. It's kind of, um, <laughs> like the mantra. But the only thing I'll, 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 I'll um, if you'll let me revise, is re reframing the issue because they didn't reframe the issue. Um, for them, actually, I, I once gave an academic talk on, on this and someone in the audience said, what kind of focus group did the water <laughs> defenders have to, to, to learn? To, you have a great laugh. <laughs> what kind of focus group did they have to change their message to, to water is life? And I actually, I'm not usually taking them back with questions. But I was silent, I don't know for how long, because I couldn't understand the question. <laughs> uh, and the reality is there was no, this was their reality. Oh, so, need to reframe. But yeah. what's interesting is that governor of the Philippines, um, who came to El Salvador, in the Philippines, um, so he's the governor of the province where there's same, this same company mines, and where there are also mm -hmm. social movements that he works with or for the recording doesn't always work with <laughs> so you have these yeah you're not supposed to always work with social movements if you're the governor in any case one of the things he learned in el salvador was the water framing and he went back to the northern philippines and started having workshops on the philippines unlike el salvador has a lot of rivers so but he started having workshops on where does your water come from not just in his province, but in other provinces. And so that was a reframing and was, was I don't know if we can talk hopefully about the Philippines, but he is trying to ban mining in his province. Um, he's trying very hard and he just got reelected. So that's pretty good news. Yeah. Um, so thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Any others? So do you know El Ecuador? Yeah, you were shaking your head. He, he, my husband, John's saying Yaku Paras, and you're shaking your head. And... Uh-huh. Uh-huh. Okay. Oh, wonderful. Okay. They, they, they used in that campaign, that was not, that was one of the ones that didn't, Right now, the, there's 14 countries in Latin America that have more than 10 million people, and 10 of them have center-left governments. So only four are right-wing uh, governments, and one of them is, is Ecuador, unfortunately. But um, they used, uh, they didn't have much money running these campaigns. And you, So he was said, running for president. He was running for president, uh, Yaku. From um, the, an indigenous people's party. And the, his first name, Yaku, means water in mm -hmm. and, it in wasn't his language, the yeah. language, the first name he was born with, but it's a, um, but then he's a lawyer, an environmental lawyer, who then became a politician. Right, but it gives you a feel for, and I don't think there's any equivalent to this really in the United States, but the politics of progressives in Latin America is he was pitted as much against the socialist who was a 
extract, you know, take the mind, the stuff out of the ground. And it was a real clash of worldviews. The, the exciting thing is that that is rising up, even in the country, so we're, which still have very, the banker one in, in Ecuador, but and there's that's a not very strong for him. That's why he's called <laughs> the he's bank. called the banker, <laughs> the banker. But it was, but Yaku almost did win. And what is hard, so to be totally honest, is the two parties, the socialists and and Yaku's party, did not come together to fight against the banker. There were enough divisions, so that that is tricky in each of these countries. And right now, already. Social movements, and this is what social movements are supposed to do, are already yelling at, well, they aren't yelling at Lulia because he isn't yet president, but they're they're yelling at Petro, they're yelling. Boric uh, also came in, some of you may have uh, followed this. Um, there was a constitutional convention in Chile that came out of a huge uprising against inequality um, in that country. And they were rewriting a constitution. They have a constitution that goes back to the dictator Pinochet. And, um, very progressive, filled with rights of nature, women's rights, LGBTQ rights, uh, and so on. And it was just defeated. So in his first six months in office, it's defeated. But it, it was it was way more progressive it was than way the, the too long with excuse me, I'm not from Chile, sorry, I didn't <laughs> say that. It was a very long constitution with a very with many controversial things that the right wing could play up. Um, so people in Chile have indicated they want a new constitution, but they want something a little shorter with fewer, <laughs> fewer, um, fewer complicated well, yeah, things. Yeah. So the, the, they'll get one. Um, but I will say to just to um, one. And of, then we should see if anyone else has yeah, any yeah, questions. One of, if Sarah wants to say. Yeah. Anything. Before we end, and, but, I mean, if you there's time for one more question, and then I feel okay. like we should um, close, and then if people want to come up and talk to you, maybe we stick around for a few minutes. Yep. Okay. Wonderful. We're yeah. not leaving Williamstown. Go, tonight. go for it. <laughs> can you actually, sorry, can you introduce yourself? Uh, Bill, uh, is there any relevance to the rest of Latin America that's been happening in Cuba for so long? Right. Yeah. So um, yes, interesting question because Cuba is the obviously the oldest socialist country um, in Latin America, the first to really poke its finger in the eye of the United States and say, "You can't tell us what to do here." Um, and Cuba has gone through a lot of interesting um, changes. It's of course it's got one of the best healthcare systems in Latin America, one of the best education systems, and also. Um, one of the strongest LGBTQ communities in Latin America. They've changed a lot of laws. So they, and they happily don't have minerals there or very little, <laughs> thank God. So they didn't, yeah, they weren't tempted by, um, they, they had the Soviet Union, which provided a lot of aid for a long time and then the Soviet Union went away. And when the Soviet Union went away, they then had no choice but to switch to organic agriculture. Yeah, so, that, so, so there's a lot of good things that are more sustainable in Cuba. And in all these Latin American countries, you see they're Cuban doctors. So they did amazing medical diplomacy, if you will. But it was it was true in El Salvador. Uh, the mayor of the town that's at ground zero of the gold mining, San Isidro, which we were just in, the mayor is a Cuban trained dentist uh, who's anti-mining. Who's anti-mining, but affiliated with the party of the president because that's a useful affiliation. That's the way, that was the way to get elected. So Cuba is still looked up to. Yeah, I think you all saw this when Biden tried to hold a summit of the Americas and tried to exclude Cuba and, and Venezuela and, and Nicaragua, many other countries, including Mexico said, sorry, we're not coming uh, if you do that. So they still have a huge amount of moral suasion. Are they seen as a model? I would say less so of these new movements that are coming up and putting ecology and indigenous rights at the center, less less so, but but an appreciation of what they've done, I would say, on healthcare and, and education. So they are, when I said there are 14 countries uh, that are center left, I mean, Cuba is included in those that have more than 10 million people uh, and they wouldn't call themselves center left, they'd call themselves left. Um, so yes, still a lot of, um, st still a lot of, 
of reverence for what you can learn from what Cuba has done. But I think these others are, are truly creating a new path that we all can learn from and be inspired from here in the United States. So when you open up your newspapers or however you get news, and it tells you all the terrible things happening around the world, and there <laughs> are terrible things happening around the world, just remember that there are these other things happening that, doesn't, that don't make the newspaper. Mm -hmm. um, be it on a, on a grassroots level, that won't make the newspaper. Um, or on a countrywide level, because the owners of the newspapers aren't going to put that. Um, I don't. You, you still. Have, we don't have a small town newspaper. Do you have small town newspapers? Oh, you do. Yeah. You know, but basically, the you know, it's a conglomeration of newspapers who aren't writing about these things. But look for it because it's actually we're incredibly hopeful. Um, I'm winding up, sir, but I, mean, <laughs> I teach environment development and globalization. There's no re you would think I would be incredibly depressed and I'm incredibly hopeful, but not because of what's happening in, Wa in the Washington DC area, but because I'm lucky enough to spend time on the ground with real ordinary people who are are doing extraordinary things, not because they want to be heroes and not because they think they're doing extraordinary things, but because they don't feel like they have any choice if they want their children and grandchildren to have a future. So it's so thank you, Williams, for whatever you did <laughs> to, to lead me on this path. And may you all have a, a path that brings you great passion. Also. Thank you. Yeah. And thank you, thank Sarah. You. Thank you. Say hi to Al.